This is the AnchorMake M5, an i3 style 3D printer with a handful of smart features at a price of 799 US dollars. Anchor is a company you've probably heard of. In fact, there's a good chance that you already own one of their products. They make charging cords, Bluetooth speakers, battery banks, and even headphones, all of which are highly rated on Amazon. So when I heard they were making a 3D printer under a branch of Anchor named Anchor Make, I was excited to see if their fit and finish would carry over here as well. As soon as I unboxed this machine, I was met with something I've never seen before, a retail box, listing all of its features and showcasing pictures of the printer inside that awaits us. The printer comes well packaged and the assembly consists of bolting the gantry to the hefty base and connecting the two Z-axis steppers as well as these two Type-C connectors that are held in place with screws. All that is behind a removable panel on the bottom of the machine. Also in the box is a toolkit, a few extra nozzles of varying sizes, and mine came with a spare bed, which is awesome, but I'm not sure if the retail machine ships with this. There's two positions for the spool holder, the top or the side. I opted to mount it on the side here. The build volume of this machine is 235 on the X and Y and 250 on the Z. It has a direct drive extruder, dual lead screws, and uses traditional V-slot roller wheels. It has a handful of smart features, so let's connect it to our Wi-Fi for use with both the desktop slicer and the Anchor Make app. Next, we need to calibrate it, and for that, we just select bed level from the menu. The machine first levels the gantry to the bed using its dual independent Z axes, followed by a grid of probe readings using the nozzle to activate a strain gauge that the hot end is mounted to. This generates our bed mesh that compensates for any unevenness on the bed itself. Also, we can set a Z-axis offset for our first layer here. Let's jump into the slicer on the desktop now. On first glance, this looks pretty similar to Cura, and in the software credits, both Cura and Slicer are listed, so it's safe to assume they've done more than just reskin a basic Cura install. In easy mode, you can select nozzle size, material, speed, layer height, and infill. Let's start with some PLA printing at normal speed. For this, I use some of the white PLA Plus that Anchor makes supplied. First up, a Benchy. This took 45 minutes to complete and the quality here looks excellent. I also found G-code for a 17 minute Benchy in the app, so let's try that as well. There's a fair amount of under extrusion here, so it looks like maybe this has reached the limitation of the hot ends volumetric output. Still, a 17 minute Benchy is quite impressive. Next, I tried PETG. When selecting PETG in the slicer, you no longer have access to the speed setting. For this, I'll use some 3DJ Clear PETG. First, let's print a Benchy. This turned out alright, with a little bit of stringing and blobbing from retractions, but there's a good amount of transparency here, which lets me know that this wasn't cooled down too quickly, and that means we'll have a good strong benchy with great layer adhesion. Next, I tried the Wild Rose Builds test cube, and here we see sort of a milky color indicating that this part was cooled down too quickly. During printing, the part cooling fans sounded like they were at full speed, so a simple max fan speed tweak in the slicer setting would take care of this. Next, some TPU. For this, I'll use some red A95 TPU from 3D Jake. 
It took me a little bit of wrestling to get the TPU in the hot end, but once it was in, it printed great. Here's the TPU Benchy. This took 45 minutes to print at a layer height of 0.2 millimeters. Next, I wanted to try some ABS. I was happy to see the auto bed adhesion in the anchor make slicer add a brim to combat some of the warping ABS commonly has. And aside from some lifting on the bottom corners, this printed really well. Let's move on to the handful of smart features this machine has. Due to its built-in camera, we have features like spaghetti detection and first layer failure detection. To test spaghetti detection, I simply queued up a print and introduced some previously cooked spaghetti. The spaghetti detection works by referencing an AI image generated after slicing. If what the camera sees differs from the generated image for six consecutive layers, the printer will pause the print and prompt the user to investigate the failure. The first layer failure detection works the same way, lifting the print head out of the way so the camera can get a good look at the first few layers to determine if they've been laid down correctly. If it senses any anomalies within the first six layers, it will prompt the user to investigate. One of my only issues with this printer is the Type-C port and no SD card slot. This means no offline printing unless you purchase a Type-C USB thumb drive. Not a deal breaker, just a bit of an inconvenience, especially if your computer doesn't have an easily accessible Type-C port. It's great to see some designs ready to print here in the app with the model designer credited properly and the license displayed as well. You can send it directly to your printer from here too. This is great for beginners and should give hours of printing fun even to the greenest of print enthusiasts. I think this is a solid printer with a pretty good ecosystem. During the filming of this review, they pushed several updates to both the machine and slicer. So I'm sure this printer will have tons of support going forward. And as long as the available catalog of pre-sliced models within the app continues to grow, this should make a great printer for beginners. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. As always, thanks for watching and happy printing.